Hey guys, Daniel here. This is another video. And in this video, I'm actually joined by the amazingly talented Wally Winger. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Wally Winger is an amazing voice actor. And some of you may know him. I personally not know him as the voice of Riddler in all the Arkham games. You know, that's right. Arkham Origins, Arkham Asylum, Arkham City, Arkham Knight. Odds are you've heard him taunt you while you search for 243 Riddler trophies. Um, but not only that, but he's also appeared in more things. He was actually Hank Pym's Ant-Man in uh, Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Uh, he was the almighty tallest red in Invader Sim. Uh, he was Renji Abari in Bleach. I'm probably not pronounced that right. And then Kotesu T. Kaburagi. I just butchered that. I'm almost certain. <laughs> and, and he also played John Arbuckle in Garfield. Uh, but he is kind, very kindly taking the time to come on and let me annoy him. Uh, but Wally, thank you so much for coming on. How are you doing today? Thanks, Danley. I'm doing great. It's a little windy here in Los Angeles, California, but at least there's no snow. So well, we on. We only get rain here, so yeah. It's raining there right now, right? It's never not raining, so yeah, it's definitely oh, raining. Well, that's, that's why it's the Emerald Isle. It's, it's uh, green all the time, and uh, that's, that's nice. Uh, very crops. It's very, very windy here, but uh, so we have uh, in uh, the state of Texas here this week, it's been very bad with a lot of snow and, yeah. everything and power outage and everything. So I guess, you know, God bless California because it's a little bit windy, but boy, at least it's still 75 degrees outside and sunny, so. I can go for a walk later if I want to, and I don't need a, an umbrella. What do you call an umbrella over there? Do you call it a... Uh, no, just an umbrella. <laughs> We're not that. <laughs> what, what's a Mac? What's, I've heard that. What, I'm going to wear a plastic Mac. A Is Mac? Like a rain? Yeah. Mac, no. I don't think so. I think, okay. I think you're getting false information, Wally. We're uh, not that... Uh, McCartney uh, put that in a song once. About, put, put on your plastic Mac. Ooh. So it's a... A yeah. testament of before I was born. Just, just to make you feel old. <laughs> It might be, it might be a kind of an outdated uh, term over there now. Plastic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and up. exactly, I definitely will. And um, but so my first question for you is, how did you get into voice acting? Well, I was about. Um, I, I voiced in uh, voices since I was uh, a kid, but when I got to be around your age, uh, my dad brought home a uh, cassette or a uh, reel-to-reel recorder that he had won in a sales contest from work. And uh, I uh, hijacked it and started to, uh, took it to my room and started radio DJ, started working on voices. And then a, a cassette recorders came out. This is way before your time. Uh, there was a cassette recorders where you could have a mic you plug in and you put a little tape in and you can record stuff. So I would uh, record stuff off TV, learn how to do voices, Laurel and Hardy, some character voices, some cartoons. Uh, I loved recording TV themes off of my favorite TV shows. So I would have this collection of, of these cassettes that I would listen to, and I'd study these voices. And then I started turning on the, the tape recorder and started listening to, to how my own voice sounded on the microphone and trying to and, – and I sounded a lot actually like you at, at your age. Um, and uh, I was trying to like do character voices. A lot of the Sesame Street characters I started trying to uh, to do when I was a kid. Uh, ever since fifth grade, I was doing uh, Ernie and Bert and Grover and Cookie Monster and all those Muppet voices. <laughs> So I, I had always studied voices uh, as, as a kid. Uh, then I got into radio when I was 16 as a radio DJ, or as you call over there, a presenter. I believe you call it a presenter. Yep, that's it. As a presenter. Uh, so as a, uh, as a radio DJ, disc jockey, <laughs> uh, playing records, and I was on the air. And I do some character voices on my show from time to time. But uh, when I moved out here uh, in the 80s, I decided uh, you know, to be an actor uh, professionally. And I uh, quickly fell out of love with uh, on-camera work because it's kind of kind of dopey and not really that creative, actually. Uh, the casting directors lack a lot of imagination, strangely enough. Uh, they kind of judge you as soon as you walk in based on what you look like, and they haven't even seen you act yet, you know. So I was like, well, I don't really like this so much. But a friend of mine told me about voiceover. I said, well, that sounds like exactly what I want to do because I've always loved cartoons. I'm a cartoonist. I, I've always drawn Popeye. I used to, yeah. in school, I used to draw the Starship Enterprise on my papers. And uh, my teacher uh, said to my parents during a parent teacher conference that uh, she was concerned because I was drawing guns on my papers. <laughs> the Starship Enterprise looks like a gun in whose world? So uh, she was, yeah, whatever. Uh, anyway, my folks are like, oh no, that's the Starship Enterprise. That's a spaceship. That's not a gun. So she's like, the teacher's like, what? 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 So my, my folks were pretty hip about it. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of how I started in, in radio and then moved out here and, and uh, decided that I wanted to uh, focus full-time on voiceover, and I really didn't care about being on, on camera anymore. And uh, I've never really pre preferred it. I've always preferred voiceover. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I've done some on 
camera stuff. But yeah, that's the voiceover is where I like to live, and um, I'll I I love working and doing stuff. It's it's a craft that I appreciate knowing and having been trained in, and it's something that I'll take to my grave with me someday as a uh, as a yeah. as a craft and a a a, 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 a vocation that I that I've loved uh, for for many many years of my life. So it's uh, fr it's funny because the first. Uh, 20 years of my professional life was radio from about 76 to, 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 to let's say, 1996. And by about 97, I was a full-time almost voiceover from 97 to, uh, wow. to, to present. So, yeah, it's pretty great. So I'm wondering what the next 20 years is going to bring. So who knows? Maybe I'll become a, an exotic dancer or a, a, a Chippendales dancer or uh, who knows? <laughs> it's the natural next step. It's the natural next step, correct? Just, correct. Yeah, just there's so many voiceover actors going to work at Chippendales when they're done with their careers. It's very uh, common. Well, I had thought about uh, possibly go do some more on camera stuff, but just kind of as me. I wouldn't change anything. I'd just be me. You know, and it's like, well, if this is what you want, then that's what you get. If not, then don't worry about it. Um, yeah, why is Wally Winger in this film? What? Yeah, <laughs> he just exactly pops down right. from the roof. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> So my main takeaway from all of that was that I sound like a young Wally Winger. So therefore, I sound like the Riddler. You know, not to brag or anything, but and well, Riddler known for being loved. So, uh, well, you know. the Riddler character is going to live a lot longer than I am. So prepare because someday <laughs> maybe you'll be auditioning for the Riddler and something someday. So you know, is that what you want to do when you uh, get older into the professional market? Is uh, well, yeah, there's a few things like, I mean, I'm a huge nerd. So like just getting to work in that general thing in like, like comic books or just, you know, like getting to contribute to something like that. You know, that's probably my dream. But, you know, I guess I'll see, you know, I'm a man of many talents. No, not really. <laughs> are you are you an artist? Is that did you draw that in the back? <laughs> no way. No, these are all from like professional artists. Like uh, some of them are actually from Ireland. And then um, I go to Comic Cons, you know, before everything shut down and I get prints like that. This is my very own print ball. I mean, I don't know why we're talking about my print ball when behind you, you have like, I, oh. which is a small part of your collection from what I heard. It's one room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. So, so you're, so uh, do you want to go into journalism uh, someday or do you want to be a voice actor? Do you want to be, do you draw? Do you? I do draw, but I am not very good at it. <laughs> uh, not yeah. yet, but you're, you're still young. So yeah. There's plenty of time to develop that. Yeah, but, you know, hopefully if I ever do get to be a voice actor, here's hoping someday I'll be as good as you and then take the Riddler role right from out under your nose. You know, just. Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> you're very good. You're very, you know what? You're going to have it. I gave, oh, you, I gave you the decency of bringing you onto the channel first to tell you. Right. Thank you. So tell just, me that you're here by my, uh, as of today, you're, you're my replacement. So uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> this was the best way to tell you, I figured. Um, <laughs> exactly. um, but, yeah, speaking of comic books. I saw a video last night of a director telling a zoom with an actress and that was him telling her that she had won the role of supergirl in the flash movie and like yes. on the zoom and she broke down in tears obviously he showed the uniform of the supergirl uniform so it was, it was pretty cool so i heard about that actually yeah apparently so for now, you to tell me that you're uh, my riddler replacement uh okay i can kind of i can kind of deal with that so, <laughs> easiest cool. way to tell you easiest way i mean <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> i cushioned you with the blow um but anyway so speaking of comic books growing up were you a comic fan at all yes i started off as a batman fan watching the 66th wow. uh, series so my first exposure was of course the tv series uh adam west uh, there he is, right back there. Ah, uh, the costume and the Burke Ward Robin costume, two of them in the background. Yes, yes, yes. That's an actual Adam West um, uh, face cast. That's his likeness for that we took back in wow. 1990 uh, with a replica costume and uh, Robin standing right next to him. Uh, and there he is right back there. You can see a um, an autographed Adam West picture kind of right there. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, that's a big poster I had him autograph. Adam and I were friends for 37 years. So really it's fun. It's fun to be able to grow up and work. Not only know your get to know your heroes, uh, but actually get to work with them. And we had worked on Family Guy together. We did two Batman films together where yes. I was the Riddler, but the 60s Riddler, Frank Gorshin. So that was that was that was kind of a kick. So, yeah, 37 years I knew Adam. So, uh, yeah, when I was exposed to Batman at the age of five in the 1966 uh, TV series, I kind of followed the comics as a result of the series. But once the yes. comics started to not be like the series anymore, I kind of lost interest. 
I was like, well, this isn't really my Batman. I don't really get this one. So they, it became in the 70s kind of darker and the, the ears got bigger and he got meaner and he was frowning all yeah. the time. I said, yeah, it's not so much my Batman. So I lost interest. But I had a really good friend named John in junior high who was uh, big into comics and I was big into comics. Wow. Um, I've, I've got a, uh, a photo somewhere of me with my comic rack. I got I had one of those spinner racks from the yes. old store. My dad was a traveling salesman and he went into a drugstore one time and they had a rack, I guess, that they were throwing out and said, hey, can I can I have that for my son? And they gave me, uh, they said, sure. So they gave, he gave me the old spinner rack. So that was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I had a huge, huge comic collection. Um, two or three different times, as a matter of fact. But my friend John actually got me into Marvel. So, uh, but I was more kind of into DC. Ha has this, I was thinking about this last night. Uh, Marvel doesn't have any secret identities anymore, do they? Because no. everybody knows that Steve, Steve yeah. Rogers is Captain America. Everybody knows that Tony Stark is Iron Man. Everybody knows that Clint is Hawkeye. There's no mass. There's no secret identities unless, well, they, I guess they even kind of know that, that Scott Lang is Ant-Man. Or does he, I, I don't know. But, but DC still has the secret identities, I think, Clark Kent, Superman, Bruce Wayne, Batman. But I really miss having the secret identities. I love that dual life thing to where, wow, they do know that it's him and he can yes. say certain things and that was part of the 66 series of batman was that that dual identity thing was so uh prevalent in the show it's like well uh i i just got a call from my friend uh, who says that the fishing <laughs> is great up at the lake so dick and i are gonna go up to the lake for a few days it's like meanwhile they're in the bat cave suit and i'm getting ready to fight crime but they're telling their loved ones that they're going to fishing you know for a couple of days going yeah. camping so it was pretty funny um and I kind of miss that about modern day, the, you know, the secret identity thing. I wish they do do that more, but uh, that was a long answer to your question. Yes. Uh, comic no, it's fine. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's the thing, like, and it's, there's, I think it's something that you can really play with the secret identity aspect of like, cause there's been a lot of Batman comics that are like, who's really, is it Batman or is it Bruce Wayne? Like who's more and who's more prevalent. And then it comes to other characters like Iron Man. And I think, in one of the films, they played with the fact that his identity was revealed and his family kind of got punished for that. And in the new Spider-Man, the mask came off. So I don't know where they're going to take that, but I think, yeah, but I think it's really fun. And I think maybe that's just the charm of old comics, the type of, oh, me, let's go. Um, but so, that's sorry, that's just me. Um, so growing up, did Frank Gorshin's Riddler at all inspire you for your take on Riddler? Uh, it absolutely did um, because I had a record album that I bought for a dollar at Woolworths, an old store. You, do you still have Woolworths over there? What? Woolworths? No, we don't have any of them. Okay. okay. I, thought in, I thought in the UK maybe they still had Woolworths. It, it's like a five and – they used to call them five and dime stores. You can get all kinds of stuff there. Uh, not like a not like a high-quality department store with a lot of clothing and stuff, but a lot of utilities and stuff you can buy. Anyway, so I loved Woolworths, and it had toys and candy and Halloween stuff, all kinds of stuff. They had a, a record bin with um, some of the records that had been discontinued. You know, you could get yeah. for a dollar, you know. And record albums at the time were, you know, $7, $8. That was expensive to a kid with a paper route. But I found the Batman TV soundtrack from the 66 Batman series. And this is in the early 70s. So, uh, of course, I bought it right away because I'm like, I got to have this. This looks great. Picture of Adam West and Burt Ward on the cover. And they had actually some of the TV voices in on the record album. Oh, you know, right. First with some of the music, yeah. So I, I listened to that thing over and over and over again. And you could hear the voice of the Penguin. You could hear the voice of Frank Gorshin, the Riddler. You could hear the voice of Mr. Freeze. All these different characters. And, of course, Batman and Robin as well. And, and some music from the show. So that was uh, wonderful. Like I said, I wore the grooves out of it to the point where it started just <laughs> skipping all over the place. You know, the, the, the stylus, boop, 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 uh, because I just wore the grooves out of it, basically. But it's, it was a fantastic album, and there was a Frank Gorshin clip actually on there that I recreated for my Riddler audition for the animated films. Uh, oh. audition for the Frank As the Frank Gorshin voice. But there was, it, doing the Arkham games, I would always say to, uh, first it was Colette Sunderman, who was the uh, voice director, and it was Amanda. I would always say, oh, they say, okay, well, you have to laugh now. Uh, do, do a Riddler laugh. And in video games, you have to laugh about a hundred different ways. 
to to short under your breath chuckles to full on maniacal laughter. So uh, I said, can I can I do a little nod to Frank Gorshin in the laugh? I'm like, oh sure sure sure. So it would <clears throat> there would be one section of the laugh that was Frank just as a kind of subtle nod to him. Wow. So so the Arkham Riddler would would laugh hysterically. He'd start off with. <laughs> <laughs> See, there was like, <laughs> yeah. just a little hint to Frank, just as kind of a tip of the hat. Um, so that was, uh, that was my, and then when I got cast as the Frank Riddler later, that was, that was amazing. And um, growing up, was Riddler your favorite Batman villain? Uh, no, as I remember, it was pro probably Joker, uh, but it was the Cesar Romero Joker. Oh, the mustache one himself, yes. With the mustache. Yeah. <laughs> But, but remember in the 60s when we watched it uh, before we had it uh, on Blu-ray or, or high definition, we never really saw that on TV because the signal just wasn't that clear. It was only a screen about this big that you were watching it on anyway. And uh, I hadn't seen Batman in color even for a long time because we had a black and white TV. So I didn't I didn't really even notice the mustache. Um, so, yeah, but until, you know, years later. Yeah. But uh but all the, all of those villains were fabulous on the Batman TV show. But uh, you know, the, it was it wasn't until years later when I started to realize the the genius of Frank Gorshin that went into that to that role. And Riddler was the very first uh, uh, villain on the Batman TV series. Uh, yeah. that was the first that was the very first episode was a, a Riddler episode. So wow. oh, he kind of launched the whole the whole ser series. Had he not been very good, it would all been over. You know, and uh, the series wouldn't have done very well. But because they, you know, predicated the whole series on that that villain, and then of course later they went to Penguin and then Joker and Catwoman, and and some of the other ones. Uh, but yeah, fantastic, just just uh, yeah, he was he was brilliant, and uh, I'm uh, just happy to be in the Batman lore uh, somewhere yeah. along along the way. And then um, then all right, so you got the role on Arkham Asylum. That was the first Arkham game. So was that kind of like, okay, well, I grew up being a Batman fan and now I'm voicing the Riddler. So was that, did that kind of like, did that feel surreal at all? Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. When, when the, when the agent called uh, to let me know that I was going to be the Riddler, I was like, what? The Riddler? Like, really? Because they wanted for the Arkham games, they wanted uh, their Riddler to be completely different from March Joker. Oh, there's right. There's always been a lot of confusion between the two characters people who just are casually interested kind of, oh yeah, that's the Joker. No, it's the Riddler. Um, oh, that's the Riddler. No, that's the Joker. So they wanted him completely, they didn't want him to sound anything like Mark's Joker. So they wanted him to sound like a, I remember the specs on the copy when it came out. They wanted him to be kind of like a TV game show host. You know, where this yeah. running Batman through these uh, tests and these trials and these games and everything. But the Riddler, as you, as you well know, in the first game wasn't even seen. I know it was just uh, his was, voice and audio tapes and yeah exactly, and uh, because the reaction of the fans was so overwhelmingly positive uh, after the first game, they said, "Well, I think now we have to actually see the Riddler." Wow! So it just kind of uh, you know exacerbated uh, uh, after that. It just did one thing led to the next, led to the next, to the next, and then the Riddler's look kind of changed throughout throughout the games. Uh, he looked like. Um, Who's the guy that played uh, House? Hugh Laurie. I think he looked like Hugh Laurie for a while. Then he looked like <laughs> Brian Cranston for a little bit, and then he ended up looking like Charlie Sheen. So oh it was, yes, it was very, it was very weird. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, it was uh, pretty, pretty great actually. Uh, just kind of, wow, this is my part in the in the Batman lore now. That's that's yeah. what I'm supposed to do. And same thing with uh, when I got Ant Man in the Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Uh, my friend John that I talked about previously, who was uh, my comic book friend in, in a junior high, had passed away uh, in oh. the mid-2000s. Mid he just had one of those weird things where you have a hole in your heart and you kind of bleed out. Oh, it was, sorry. It was, it was unfortunate. But so, you know, when I got the Ant-Man role in like 2010 or 2011, something like that, I just uh, threw my hands to the sky and I said, John, I'm an Avenger. <laughs> you were right. <laughs> comic books were cool. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Did the voice of Riddler come to you organically? Like you were like, okay, I know what the Riddler should sound like. Or did you have to sit down with Paul Dini maybe and then try and craft it? Or did they just say, make him sound like a game show host and then that just like, okay. Yeah, that was it. Uh, the really? There was wow. no sitting down with anybody 
because the copy went out to hundreds, maybe thousands of guys uh, for the Riddler, and they just said game shows, whatever. So I'm reading the copy, and I, knowing what I knew about the Riddler uh, from my, my history with him is he's, he loves to hear himself talk. Um, he thinks he's just saying yeah. the most important stuff to the, you know, that could possibly be uh, imagined. And uh, there was a, a gleeful delight in some of the horrible things he was saying. I know. Well, I think yeah. There's something about uh, killing a baby or something. Yeah, in the first one. Hug- what box and tree yeah, legs? He, yeah, he's not my baby. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, so, uh, so I thought, all right. Well, knowing what I knew about the history of uh, TV and characters and stuff, there was a character called Doctor Loveless on um, a show called Wild Wild West when I was a kid, and he was a little person, uh, an actor named Michael Dunn, but he would do the most horrific things. To, uh, to Jim West, who was the hero. Uh, the show was basically James Bond in the Old West, which was a brilliant concept. But I loved uh, Michael Dunn's Dr. Loveless character because yeah. he would say things so, so gleefully that were just so horrible. Like, he's <laughs> like, no, Mr. West, we're going to boil you in acid and your skin's going to fall off from your bones. It's going to be great. And as opposed to like, we're going to boil you in acid. And your skin's going to fall. You know, as opposed to saying yeah. it like a villain would, he was like, no, this is this is what I enjoy. And it was like so demented that he uh, just could say such horrible things with such a gleeful tone. So I said, well, that I want the Riddler to have that. And secondly, there was a uh, <clears throat> see if I can do this. There was a director that I worked with in the Midwest who was a uh, community theater director. And uh, he would uh, he would have always have a cigarette he was a chain smoker and he would he would uh have uh, his glasses like this and he had a full full beard and he would be directing us he'd be like picking his beard and he'd be thinking picking his beard picking his beard and this director loved hearing himself talk because he just thought every word that came out of his mouth was gold (laughs) and i said this is this is what this is the quality i want so I actually kind of half was Michael Dunn and the other half was this director because he'd go, I think we're up to performance quality with the possible exception of Wally. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was, but he was sarcastic. He was, he was funny. Yeah. Uh, and he, he wasn't serious, but it was that dry sarcasm. But he had that kind of well, here we are again, everybody. And every just yeah. there was a hint of like bite and sarcasm in his voice, but he, he loved chewing every word came out of his mouth because he thought just thought everything that he said was so important. <clears throat> and it was a, it was a great you know character. So when you develop a character like that, sometimes you can take portions of a different like other actors or other voices that you like uh, from entertainment, but you can also hybrid them. Um, with uh, voices from people you know or people that you worked with. So yeah. because we would all do impersonate this director back in the old days behind his back, and we'd be like, <laughs> okay, well, here's what we're going to do now. Wow. We are going to completely recast the show. <laughs> and so, so, uh, so when I think the first uh, line in the audition was, Roll up, roll up, it's the Enigma Show. Well, Batman, isn't that special that you've come to play with us today? You hear that that, that quality of the, the, the here to play with us today? Yeah. With the possible exception of one. <laughs> so there was, there was that whole thing in there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you can take, you know, uh, voices from people that you, you know in regular life, uh, as well as actors and stuff. So it's pretty fun. Wow. And like when you worked on Asylum, did you ever figure that you'd work on three more Batman Arkham games or did you think, right, so I'm just going to do Asylum? Yeah, no, I I had no clue. Uh, I was a little disappointed that he wasn't uh, even going to be seen because I said, well, what's he he look like? And they said, well, we don't know. You're not going to see him. You're just going to hear tapes. I'm like, what? Really? Uh, Because it was all about the Joker. Everything was Joker, 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 Joker. But, you know, that that runs its course after a while, and pretty soon you're going to need some other characters. You can't always just have the Joker, you know. Um, 
you know, Lone Ranger had Butch Cavendish, but he also had, you know, some other people that would fight. So you got to have the, the full rogues gallery. Even on the 66 series, they didn't just focus on one villain all the time. They would, every week, it was a, it was a different villain. And some worked and some, some didn't. But I'm like, okay, well, I'll just sit back and, and wait my turn. <laughs> and, um, you know, eventually it kind of rolled around to, you know, more Riddler, which was kind of cool. And then they explored Catwoman more and they explored Harley more and they explored, you know, some of the other ones, Killer Croc and, and Two-Face. So yeah. that, was, that was pretty cool. And you were just like, no, get out of my way. Let's do a Riddler one now. Come on, when's my turn? <laughs> well, I, I don't mind uh, when Riddler's kind of just peppered in. Yeah. I don't, want it, I don't want him to suffer the same overexposure as the Joker did. Because yeah. there's Joker burnout now, I think. It's like you got the, the Joker movie and you've got the Joker from the Chris Nolan films. You got the Jack Nicholson Joker you got the Cesar Romero Joker. You got Mark's Joker. You got all these Jokers. It's like enough already. You know, it's like it's too many jokers. And you know, let's uh, let's ease yeah. off a little bit. I mean, there's a ton of Batman characters they haven't even begun to explore yet. But but did you notice in the new movie, the Batman, who's the who's the villain? Hey, hey Riddler himself. That's why. So you, it's a very organic way to put it in. One of my questions: uh, What are your thoughts on Paul Dano or Paul Dano? I'm not sure being casted as the Riddler. Do you have any thoughts on that? No, I, 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 he's a he's a great actor. I loved him as uh, Brian Wilson in the uh, movie that he did, uh, Love and Mercy. Um, it's yeah, going to be very dark, I think. The Riddler yeah, from what it's going to be very dark, yeah, very, yeah, really dark. That well, that's the problem with a lot of the uh, Batman stuff where I kind of hit yeah. the projector button and left. Was it just it's so dark that there wasn't any heroics left really in him. Um, I like Batman to kind of be that charming. I liked him to be a little bit of a Boy Scout, you know. Yeah. Uh, but that he that they got he got criticized for that in the '66 series that he's just too much of a out and he's like helping little old ladies across the street and what. <laughs> so what's wrong with that? You know, you don't always have to be pissed off at the world every day and have to go out and you know I don't know. Yeah. That, that the whole dark element I can see where it kind of plays into that character, but again I think there's an over accentuation these days of just making every superhero dark well they got to have their dark side they got to no 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 just let him be a superhero you know <laughs> well they got to have some sort of weird twisted thing in there no 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 not, not at all and that's what i kind of enjoy about captain america in the marvel films is he's captain america he's he's gone yeah. home he's like hey here we go i'm captain america and this is what i do and there's no like dark side to him there's no pathos there's no weird like affectation going on he he wanted to join the military. He was too skinny. And he said, yeah, sign me up for this program. So uh, he, he's a good guy. So I, I really, um, you know, even Superman has to, they seem to have to want to make him kind of yeah have some sort of angle. It's like, could we just be Superman? You know, could we just be truth, justice, the American way? And Christopher Reeve flying through the, yeah. you know, he, here he is uh, right over here. Da, 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 wow, your very own Superman shrine. Uh, and you're a Batman villain. You can't have that there. Exactly right. Well, uh, who knows? I, I won't uh, report you. I won't report you. Um, yeah, but that's very um, interesting, I think, because you, you're like a testament of Adam West's Batman. But I grew up like peak Christopher Nolan, Batman Arkham game. Like, I think it was 1980s when Batman became dark with the Frank Miller comics. So I've only ever really known a dark character. Like, me and my friends would run around pretending we're characters from the Arkham City. Like, me and my friends, Bobby and Jagger, we'd all pretend that we were different Arkham characters. And then we'd also, like, and I just grew up knowing Batman as this brooding character. So I wonder maybe if we swapped when we were born. Like, if I grew up during the 60s and you grew up when I grew up, if it would maybe be different. Because well, I, I always say that your favorite James Bond is whoever you're, you saw in the, your first James Bond yeah. movie. Yeah. You don't see a bunch of James Bond movies and then go, oh, yeah, the guy from several <laughs> movies ago, I like him, but no, no. It's always who you grew up with. And I grew up with Roger Moore, and he was always my favorite Bond. But, you know, people are like, oh, no, Sean Connery. Well, what was your first movie that you ever saw? A oh, James Bond movie. Oh, Goldfinger. Well, no wonder you like you know, so, <laughs> yeah. so it's uh, So it, you're, it, it's whatever your first exposure to that, I think, is that's going to be ingrained in you as, as probably your, your favorite. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's that's completely fine. What what character did you play when you were out playing uh, Arkham? Well, my friend Jagger would be Batman. My friend Bobby was Joker. I was Riddler. I was actually Riddler. I'm not even joking. I was Riddler and Two-Face. Those were two of them. And Red Hood from the Arkham Knight game. 
but nice. I was those three characters and we'd all kind of swap around. And um, but like I literally was like, haha, I got you now, Batman. And we were just running around pretending that we were and like we do riddler races in the yard. We'd like right. run from one point to the other. And oh my god, looking back, I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> so did you actually uh, dress up and do this or did you not in school? Uh, we had uniforms, so you couldn't oh, I actually oh, okay. I have a Riddler jacket. I got it at Hot Topic, like and like it it, did, it doesn't even fit me now. Like I got it when it was like one size too small. I was like, ma'am, this is ten euro. Well, ten dollars. So we have to get it. So and like it's like it's like a long kind of trench coat from the like kind of Jim Carrey Riddler, but I still have that. It does not fit me, but I still kind of I was tempted to put it on for the interview just to just oh, I, you, it on. you're gonna have to get one shot of you uh, in that jacket before you have to just kind of put yeah. that in. And, uh, <laughs> My belly would jacket. stick out of it, man. Now, <laughs> I, now you now that you've mentioned it you absolutely have to put that on because now um, all the viewers at home are going to want to i got myself there with that one right well now <laughs> ask me for you no, can't no. bring stuff like that up without actually uh having to put it on. well i've learned my lesson now i suppose um but speaking so do you do a riddler of impression like a voice impression yeah I, I did do a riddler impression but it was just kind of me trying to do a kind of high-pitched annoying voice like i got you now batman it didn't sound anything like it but i just kind of do that when I was like, you know, nine running around. So that was like, right, did right. you uh, impersonate Frank Gorshin's Riddler growing up? No, I was Batman. I wow. Had the, uh, <clears throat> I had the uh, bath towel uh, safety pinned around my neck, you know, like a towel <laughs> for a cape. And I had the Halloween mask on and I had my little friend uh, Galen who was dressed as Robin and we'd run around the neighborhood and do all kinds of stuff. So it's pretty, uh, pretty fun. But yeah, that was, that was, I was all about, you know, being Batman when I was a kid. And then when I got, older i started cosplaying as this in that costume right there that was my costume oh was it the adam west conventions and stuff so yeah i was uh i was all about that and it, not not so much uh I, I never cosplayed as a villain uh i did darth vader uh but i was always more more about the heroes but i i don't have the kevin conroy voice so or the adam west voice so it's like whatever so uh, i'll be a villain that's fine as long as i'm in there somewhere you know um uh, yeah able to be in the in the batman uh, lore somehow i'm happy to be i think riddler appealed to me because when i was younger i thought well he has brown hair so like i automatically look like him so i kind of think all right well i can green and he's dressed in green it's very irish exactly see see that it's just a sign i am the riddler so uh that's why i'm taking your job so i figure <laughs> this has to happen it's like out of me and you who has brown hair so you, you, you know. can't take what's given to you so uh i I'd be crazy oh right, okay. You are you are intimidated by me. I understand. I understand. It's okay. Right. Absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but you got to play two versions of the Riddler. Um, of course, the Frank Gorshin one and the Arkham one. But how did that era of Frank Gorshin Riddler come about? Did they just say, "Here, do you want to do it because you played Riddler in the past," or did you say, "How did that come about?" Um, I have a really good friend who's a uh, an animator and a storyboard artist, and he's also a big '66 Batman fan. And his name is Ruben. And he said, um, well, Adam and Bert had said at a convention that they're, uh, I, I don't think they were supposed to mention this, but they said that they're working on an animated film. And everybody's like, what, 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 what? <clears throat> so I called my agent. I said, whatever you can find out about this film, please let me know because I want to do something in it. Yeah. So Ruben had actually been hired to do the storyboarding and some of the animation. So he said, oh, yeah, I, I you know, I'm working on this film, and if you want to audition for any of the characters, I can get your audition directly to the producer. And I was like, wow. So <clears throat> I couldn't really do a Cesar Romero. Uh, Burgess Meredith, I was way off on. Yeah. And I definitely didn't sound like Catwoman. <laughs> yeah, so I said, I think, I think, because I knew Frank Gorshin. He, he'd been over to my house for a couple wow. of times and, and been to a movie party. So I, I knew Frank. Um, not super well, but we, you know, would cross paths all the time. He knew who I was, and I knew, obviously, who he was. Um, so I was just kind of thinking about how I could do possibly him, since he was he was a buddy. Uh, and uh, I just sat at home one night and listened to a bunch of his clips, including the, the riddle that he did on the record album that I told you about earlier that I bought for a dollar. Yeah. And I just put a bunch of random Frank Gorshin Riddler lines together <laughs> along with the laugh and uh, put some music under it and sent it to Ruben and said, well, see if, see if they like this. 
and then that's that's what got me cast as the Riddler. So, wow, cool. yeah. And so that that must have been so fun. And the thing about voice acting that fascinates me is obviously you record it. And I know that in the type of older cartoons, such as like Batman, the animated series, they all record in the same room. So is that the same for the video games or would you just come in one by one? Uh, The latter, one by one. Because uh, video games, uh, in a cartoon, uh, you have a script, uh, three acts, start to finish, and it is what it is. Uh, In a video game, there could be several different outcomes. Uh, this character could live. This character could be shot by an arrow in the arm. This character could be deboweled. This character could be had his head cut off. All in a kid's uh, cartoon. Yeah, all in a kid's cartoon, <laughs> right? But this is but this is a video game, remember? So yeah. th- because there are several different possible outcomes, you have to record all of those possible outcomes. Okay, well oh. now uh, laugh uh, maniacally. Okay, well laugh uh, with like your leg has been cut off. Okay, now scream like you're on fire. Okay, scream. So, because a lot of this stuff can happen in the game. It just depends on how, how the player plays. So when you're there for four hours, it's just your stuff because uh, there's the cutscenes that are away from that, and then there's the in-game stuff. <clears throat> so there's a lot of material to record, especially for a major character like you know Riddler or Batman or Joker or yeah. whatever. Sometimes it can take two or three different sessions. But... Um, yeah, so it's it's just one guy at the time uh, doing all of the stuff that he has to do or she has to do for their character um, in in one session. You're it's just you and the director. Uh, but for an animated show or a movie, it usually is an ensemble where we're all sitting around in a kind of semicircle with a bunch of microphones uh, playing off each other. So wow, it's, it's quite it's quite a different uh, protocol. Video games versus you know animated. Uh, cartoons yeah and like the thing about the riddler is like I, I like whenever i play the games i hear his voice a lot and then recently i was i was replaying them for research because i'm very professional i made the sacrifice to play my xbox all day just for this interview oh boy oh. that must have been tough man. i know like you could have been outside getting exercise and playing in the rain I'm doing and homework around, like like gene yeah. kelly but no yeah. you are a professional you've sat inside oh, with body video stuff game con- stuff yeah. <laughs> I'll have to tell. So now I have a reason why I didn't do my maths homework. Look, I hate to break. I was, I was playing Batman Arkham City, you know. Um, yeah, but like the thing about Riddler is he has so much like lines and like every time there's a riddle, like there's one riddle I remember. I don't know why. Maybe I think it was my last riddle, but it was like roll up, roll up to the circus of strange. This poor sign professor is clearly deranged, and like so you see those type of riddles a lot. So I was just wondering, did it take you long to film each game? Um. It depends on how much stuff there is. We can usually get everything done in a, in a four-hour session, uh, but wow. occasionally there are pickups. You have to go back and do a couple hours extra of additional things. And then once the animation is finished, you'll have to go in and do what's called ADR, which is additional dialogue recording. Um, there's a million different names for it, but that's the one I like, additional dialogue recording. So um, where you'll actually see the animation – and then you'll have to put your your voice to it, uh, because it's uh, effort noises. So if they if they if they animate in that the Riddler is bumps into something or hits something or or moves or lifts something, mm-hmm. you've got to go in there and go. Ugh! You know, you've got to add those sounds to the thing. Otherwise, it's just him lifting and there's no there's no vocalization. So, but you're watching the animation in that r- instance. Oh. Uh, and and, cha- and what doing what's called chasing it. You're actually chasing the action with your your voice sometimes it can be just a short little effort noise or sometimes it's going to be a long scene to where he's running stopping picking something up doing something else and then you've got to chase all that with your vocalizations as you're watching it so you have to go (laughs) as you're watching the action but that hopefully will match the action of what the animation team has has put into the to the videos so it's uh, it's all kind of exciting. So it wow. could be two or three different sessions for this, but it's uh, it's pretty exciting, you know. And I'll I'll be the Riddler as long as I can. So um, that's what he thinks. That's what he thinks. Everyone. That's what I think. That's yeah. why <laughs> just everyone just keep it quiet. Don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to. Uh, clutch it from my cold dead hands yeah that's right wally you're gonna play the riddler you're gonna play <laughs> um thank but you, you, yeah. i could literally talk to you about riddler all day but there's another character i want to talk to you about it's probably 
one of your other more iconic characters, it's Almighty Tallest, Red from Invader Sim. Uh, so what was it like to get to voice him? Uh, it was fantastic, uh, especially when because I didn't wasn't reading comics at the time, and I definitely wasn't reading any of the uh, slave labor graphic comics that Joan and Vasquez had come from. So when they said there's a comic book artist to as a Nickelodeon show, I'm like, oh, that's that's cool. And then I realized that it was way wacky. I'm like, wow, this is really unusual and fun. Uh, it was great, and I'd known Richard Horvitz, who played Zim. I'd known him for several years. And it was one of the first, uh, I think it was the first series regular that I had gotten on an animated show. I'd done a bunch of guest stuff on Family Guy. Yeah. But it was pretty exciting in that, no, this is my character now. And at that point in my career, I'd done a lot of voice matches with other people's characters. For example, um, uh, Cubby from Peter Pan, you know, the old Peter Pan movie. Yeah. Uh, when they wanted uh, Cubby, they, you know, would have me come in and do that voice the same voice that you would hear back in the old uh, feature film from the 50s. Uh, but it was somebody else's character. Somebody else had done it previously. Uh, also, Dave Foley as Flick in the Bugs Life stuff. Sometimes he wasn't always available. He had a series at the time. I think he was doing news radio. So he wasn't really able to come in. So I come in and, hey, hey, Princess Ada. Oh, it's perfect. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I would come in and do him. And then he didn't uh, sing either. So when Flick had to sing, they would have me come in and do it. So, yeah. But again, it was another voice match, and it's somebody else's character, and that's fine. So this is, uh, I think Invader Zim was really the first time where it's like, no, this is my character. Nobody else has ever done this before. This wow. is originating. So that's kind of a cool uh, moment in your career when you can get to the point where you're voicing an original character that nobody's ever done before. That's kind of cool, actually. You seem to voice some of the more um, bad guys, I suppose. Um, but like, yeah, so Invader Sim, like that was... They're, they're more fun to play, the bad guys. Exactly. You know, they're, yeah. they're all known for being lovely people, very kind. <laughs> lovely people, it's, yes. Especially the Riddler, who's talking about chopping off baby's legs. He's lovely, you know, just... Right. <laughs> a good time. You just have to catch him early in the morning. He's really nice. Get him a coffee. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah that's... <laughs> you get him before his first coffee, he, he's pretty uh, compliant. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's after the thing. That, after he has that first... Uh, <laughs> Latte. But where's Batman? Where's Batman? <laughs> right, exactly. I'm um, but like obsessed. And your like your voice is Riddler, and it was so good because like towards when you're like collecting your last Riddler trophies, like you could you come off as nervous. You're like, oh, you're you're there's only ten left. What? How? I mean, this is fine. And like I remember thinking, man, oh, I can't wait to get this. And like a lot of the dialogue is very like you know intelligent words and like words that I didn't really understand. So for <laughs> you. I, for you, when you went on it, did you understand some of this stuff? Or was no, there some no. words you didn't, none, none of no. it? No, we had, there were several times uh, where we'd have to stop the session uh, and look up a word. <laughs> it's like, I don't even know what this word means. <laughs> I don't even know if I'm saying it right. You're like, so like, all right. So we'd stop the session and we'd go online tika, 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 and look up the word. Oh, okay. Because the guys who write this stuff are brilliant and yeah. they, you know, find all this stuff and, and throw this stuff at it. I mean, it those the, the the lines that they wrote were were so fantastic that you never really had to change anything. And sometimes in a cartoon, you'd be like, "Well, the character I don't think really would say it this way. I think he'd say it this way." Well, let's do a, a pass, uh, of, like you think that the okay. Well, John Arbuckle I think would say it this way. So can we do one pass where I say it like like this? Okay, we'll try that. I think it's more in character. Family Guy. We never had to change anything because all that stuff was was perfect. It was funny and amazing. And you never had to change anything in the art, in the Riddler stuff because everything was just written so perfectly that yeah. what could I do to possibly, you know, help this line along? Well, the answer is nothing because it's already it's already perfect. So um, maybe I'll just I could add a little laugh. That's that was my only additions to some of those lines were just adding a laugh for some sort of effort or disgusted sound or something. Other than that, changing the words was was really unnecessary. Yes. Wow. And like, you're not only, you've also done video games and cartoons, but you also have voice acted in the world of anime. And like, I know when it comes to anime, it can be a bit hard because obviously they're made in Japan for Japanese voice actors. And then they get dubbed by English people and you kind of have to match their mouth. So you can kind of hear voice actors going, oh, well, what is happening here? You know? So for you, is there a difference between voicing cartoons and like anime? 
Uh, yes, well, the yeah, original animation is uh, completely different from anime because when you're doing original animation, it's just you, like I said, sitting in a semicircle of a bunch of people, and then the animators animate to what you did, to what to to your mouth oh, sounds. Yeah. So they'll run that back, and they'll, so they'll start off with the what's called the radio show, which is just the the all the voices, all the selects that the director has chosen, and then they animate to that. Uh, but when a cartoon comes over from Japan or wherever that you've got to, to loop, um, the writers who write this stuff have the heavy lifting to do because they've got to take the the meaning and the intent behind the scene. They also have to take the dialogue that's been translated to English and try and rewrite it to keep the same intent but still match the lip flaps. Yeah. Um, so it's really great to be able to do something like Tiger and Bunny, if you've ever seen that show. Yeah. That's Kotetsu Kabaragi, um, where they've got helmets on most of the time, so you don't have lip sync. <laughs> so I, if, you're a, if you're an anime dubber, mm -hmm. the three letters that you want to see on a script is M and S, mouth not seen. Oh, right. Right. So I can, as long as you can get whatever you need to say in that time of space where they're on camera, that you're fine, uh, which was great about Tiger and Bunny is that we could ad lib. If the masks were on and we didn't have lip sync to worry about, we could we could ad lib and put different things in and, and really kind of yeah. make the character kind of our own. Um, but yeah, when when the character's on and they have the lip flaps, uh, you have to kind of watch out for that. Sometimes the lines are written a little too long. Uh, so you have to kind of uh, at, during the session, the director will say, all right, well, take out that word, move that away, and contract that, and okay, then now, now it fits. So sometimes they work, and most of the time they work, about 90%, because these anime writers are so good at figuring out how many syllables go into how many lip flaps. <clears throat> you know, they can count those flaps. Yeah. But sometimes a line is underwritten, so you have to kind of add something, and sometimes the line is overwritten, and you just have to kind of doctor it on the fly and see what, what you can come up with. So it's pretty exciting. Some of the best actors I know are anime actors because it's like jogging with weights on your legs. <laughs> you're, re you're so restricted by a lot of different things. Lip sync, uh, mouth flaps, uh, voice, the character. You got you to gotta stay in voice. You got to stay in character. You gotta, your acting has to be good, and you got to match those, the technological aspects of the lip flaps. Wow. So it's, it's pretty exciting. So anime doesn't pay over here very well at all. Really? Uh, in fact, it's horrible pay, uh, like really terrible. But we do it because we love it and because it's fun and it keeps our chops up for, you know, watching this stuff and, and doing it. And it just it's a good exercise, you know. So the check will show up and you'd be like, all right, well, you know, whatever. It's coffee money. <laughs> but where you really make the money is if you can do a, a great character like Kotetsu or, or get a great character like uh, Renji and get cast as Renji or one of the Transformers or whatever. And then you can do the, the autograph circuit and you make yeah. more money in a weekend than you've ever made doing the actual show. I did a Power Ranger convention in November of 2019 and I made more money in that weekend just signing photos than I ever did doing the actual voice on the show. So, wow. I, you know, the, the total amount of that I made on the show was probably $300 or something like that. And I, I wasn't as Blue Psycho Ranger. I wasn't on a lot. But, you know, it's, it's $60 here, $100 here. It's whatever. <laughs> but that week, that one weekend, I made so much more than I ever made on the show. I'm like, well, that's, that's why we do the anime shows is so we can go out and sign the photos for the fans and make the big money. <laughs> so it's kind of a weird yeah. little secret, yeah, that nobody knows. But it's eh. – now you know. Now the world knows. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yes, as I'm sure you can imagine, my videos, they get millions of views. That's going to go to everyone. So uh, yes. you've done yourself there, Wally. I mean, you know, that's on you. That's on you. You should have. Well, the way you're going to get all the views is if you show up in that Riddler jacket. That's how, what's going to get all the views. Absolutely. You just love circling back to that, don't you? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I'm not going to let that one go because you can't <laughs> say something like that and not. Absolutely. All right, well, no. if, I, if it's not in this video, then there'll probably be a link in the description for that photo. Uh, oh, no, if it'll, be in this, it'll, 
It'll be in this video. <laughs> okay, well now I just felt like I have to. And <laughs> It'll it better be in this video. All right, all right, all right. Okay. <laughs> all right, so um, it, enough of my Riddler jacket. Another thing I want to talk to you about while researching you, because I'm very professional and I'm you very know, professional, very very professional. I can tell. <laughs> and but you are another part of my childhood. You also voiced John Arbuckle in Garfield, and I remember like literally coming home and watching Garfield. So and he believe it or not he's not actually a bad or he's not a villain like almighty tallest red or the riddler so uh what was it like to get to voice him yeah he's a dork well it was uh it was fun because it started off with one uh movie a garfield movie called garfield gets real and i'd originally be cast as a different character in the in the show and i'm one of the other characters i'm like okay that's cool i'm in this garfield movie so i show up and there's a script on uh, everybody's chair when they come in because they want everybody to do the table read, which is uh, where all the actors just get together. You might record it, you might not, but it's where you just basically oh, yeah. sit around a table and read just so the writers can hear it out loud with the actors doing it, and then they can make changes before you go into the recording session. <clears throat> so um, my script said, uh, Wally, John. And I was like, no, I'm not John. I'm, I'm this other character. I think you made a mistake. Oh, no, you're John. But I thought I was cast as now we, we made a change of John now. So I guess because um, Jim Davis had had a, a hand in casting. And I guess he saw something. This, this audition process for the Garfield thing was weird because it wasn't just uh, audio. They actually had a camera running. So I guess Jim Davis could actually look at the actors coming in. And I guess he saw something in me that he thought was dorky enough like John Arbuckle <laughs> and uh so I'm I'm eternally grateful because that's another great franchise that I was blessed to, to be involved in and I love the character because he's kind of me I have a dog and a cat John Arbuckle's voice is basically how I talk to my dog and my cat hey guys you want to go out for a walk let's go okay and oh, you feed them you, you feed them lasagna I imagine well strangely enough um <laughs> I had some lasagna one night that I, you know, one of those frozen dinners and I made it and I had a little bit left and I just had it in the sink and I come out to do something and my cat is in there, you know, eating the rest of the thing. So I said, I got to get my camera. So I took a picture of my, my cat Spooky uh, eating the, the rest of the lasagna and I said, and I tweeted out, I said, my God, Jim Davis was right. Cats do like lasagna. <laughs> so it was kind of an eye-opening uh, moment for me. But no, I, I talked to basically, I talked to them the way John Arbuckle talks to them. And that's the that was the whole uh, basis for the John Arbuckle voice is like, well, I'm just talking to them like I would talk to my dog and cat. So. Oh, right. A little bit of method acting, I suppose. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Yeah, that's right. And so, then. Uh, I, well, you, you do what you know, you know. Yeah. Uh, you They say if you're a writer, you got to write what you know. If you're a uh, actor, you do what you know. And, and so all, all those life experiences that you have, you know, working with the director in the Midwest who turns into the Riddler, you know, later. Um, all those life experiences that you gather up can be used in your catalog, what Bob Bergen calls your spice rack, uh, that you use later if you're going in to do a character. Well, I think I'm going to add a little bit of this, add a little, oh, bit, of yes. that, add a little bit of that. So all, all of those experiences uh, add up, you know, and, and kind of, populate your spice rack for that those kind of um uh, professional experiences that you will have later so i mean if you had an aunt you know with a pati particular kind of drawl or a kind of thing you could always imitate you know, put a little of your aunt esther in there and <laughs> a little bit of your uncle bob and a, bit, a little bit of that and a little bit of this so and nobody's ever going to know unless you're doing an exact ripoff of a celebrity voice yeah, uh, but uh, like you know, the the Flintstones was a direct ripoff of the Honeymooners, which was a a TV show in the fifties with Jackie Gleason and Art Carney, and that was that was basically an animated Honeymooners, and uh, Mel Blanc didn't want to imitate another actor. He didn't think it was the right thing to do, but they said, "Oh no, this is this is an animated Honeymooners. You've got to sound like Ed Norton," mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hey, Rofi, <Ruffy>, baby. <clears throat> you know, there's a whole thing. <clears throat> with the uh, with the honeymooners and, and Mel Blanc's now nah, I don't want to I don't want to imitate another actor and then finally he did because he realized that no this is basically what this is is an animated honeymooners so he finally acquiesced but um yeah it's just 
your your experiences kind of color your your life and personally and professionally and everything. So always listen to relatives and friends and you know even if you imitate teachers at school you know yeah. that, that, that can be you know used uh, as well um uh, you just never know where you're going to get the next great character from so that's it that's exactly it and um yeah so there's another like god you've done like a million characters so this interview could go on forever but another character <laughs> you worked on was ant-man and i have such it's such a silly question but i want to ask you who'd win in a fight between riddler and ant-man well, Riddler's really kind of a wuss. Yeah, well, uh, he's a big robot. Also... He's a big robot fighting machine. So um... yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and Pym would figure out how to de, how to decompose yeah, actually, the yeah. Riddler robots because he's smart. He'd shrink down. He like he did with Ultron. He'd get in the back. He'd go in the inner circuitry and the neural network, and he'd figure out a way to shut it down. So uh, Ant Man would totally win because he's... Yeah, imagine if, if they'd be like enemies for life because Riddler would just constantly be trying to one up him. Well, Riddler thinks he's smart, but Pym is smart. That's the difference. Yeah. Because Riddler's not really that smart. If you remember, um, the Riddler started out in the comics as a guy who uh, cheated. Cheated. And yes, his yeah. father wasn't. Yeah. And I think your that game was the only canon version we've ever seen of his actual backstory in the comics. Because in like right. the Jim Carrey film or... They never really talk about that in front. Like, and in the fight scene, at the when you collect all the Riddler trophies, you hear uh, Riddler going, "Die, father!" I mean, Batman. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I remember, yeah, I giggled. A lot of, uh, lot of uh, yeah, daddy issues there. <laughs> um, but but there, uh, yeah, in the original uh, Riddler comic uh, where he he came out, it, it shows him uh, cheating on a test, like sneaking in, opening up the teacher's desk, and finding up the answers and then do so he he's basically a cheater he likes to think he's smart uh but i don't really think he's well obviously because batman can always out, outsmart him so he batman really is smart uh pym really is smart uh riddler only thinks he's smart <laughs> and bloviates a lot about how smart he is but i'm not convinced that he's really all that smart all the time um he's just driven and angry um but that's why he's so offended when Batman solves his uh, crimes or solves his riddles because he so always says, you cheated. Yeah. He says, well, he's projecting on the Batman what he hates about himself. He's a cheater. You know, Riddler's a cheater. So whatever. Yeah. And like so. Riddler, like in every game, he was kind of different. So our first introduction to Asylum, we get the kind of idea that he's psychotic. And then in Origins, he's not really, he's still Eddie Nash kind of, and he's not really the Riddler yet. He's still trying to find out who he is. And in City, it's kind of like Riddler in his prime. And then at night, you can tell he's kind of at his breaking point and he's just dedicated to beating Batman. So do you have a favorite version of Riddler out of every game? I like the really insane one. Uh, I think he's kind just... Kind of the Arkham Knight one, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think he's nuts. Um, yeah, he... Well, the, the Origins was interesting because they had um, done some recasting because they wanted the characters to sound you know, younger because they wanted to go back in time yeah. before they, but they, they had me come in. They said, no, we think you'll be able to adjust the character enough to where he can sound a little less sure of himself at this point in his life where he's not quite the Riddler yet, but he's kind of coming into that. I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's cool. I can, you know, play that obviously down, but that's the thing I liked about not only Riddler, but Pym was they had the best story arcs. Yeah. Of, of any of the characters because if you think about you know because when i got cast into this mightiest heroes hey i'm ant-man they're like who ant-man you know the guy that shrinks down and they're like well that's not as cool as being captain america the hulk but but those characters are straight line you know thor is thor until you know uh end game where he turned into the fat slobby guy <laughs> he kind of had a character a, a diversion there but you know captain america is captain america hulk is hulk Thor is Thor, Iron Man, kind of here and there. But Pym, if you know anything about Pym from the comics, and having been a comic fan from, from a kid, I knew all about this, is that Pym was, you know, a scientist who wanted to use science to, to better mankind. Yeah. He didn't want to be a crime fighter or a fighter. He didn't want to fight, do violence. But he did it kind of unwittingly because he feel, felt he had to. He didn't want to release Ultron on, on the world. He didn't want to reprogram him to fight because Ultron was a, just a servant, just a humble little servant. Well, you know, if we program Ultron 
to, you know, to know what violence is and what conflict is, then we could be opening up a Pandora's box. And, of course, that's what happened. But Pim, uh, you know, faked his death. Uh, he went crazy and faked his death. And they thought he was dead, but he came back as, you know, Goliath in the comics, Yellow Jacket in the, in the series. And so here's this guy who's kind of unstable anyway, but he's a genius. And he doesn't want to be a superhero, but he is. And then he... His his creation, Ultron, his prize creation, he had to kind of sell out for the to, you know, fight the yeah. Kree and the Skrulls, the whole thing, and it was it was pretty great. And then he fakes his death, and then he comes back as a completely different personality. He's wacky, and I'm like, wow, the character arc for this guy <laughs> is so interesting. It's all over the place. Wait, is he dead? So, is he alive? Wait, what? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I have the comic. Uh, it's a big giant thing, and I bought it at Comic Con of the Avengers, where uh, this character Goliath comes and he you know while Pym has faked his death I think I'm remembering this correctly he's figured out how to not just shrink but actually grow in size so yeah he can yeah yeah so now he can be uh so he comes out of this character named Goliath and um and then he became like giant man later but he had a blue suit for a while so they weren't really because he was masked they weren't really sure you know who this Goliath guy was but then they find out it's Hank Pym, like, you're alive? Weird. <laughs> what? It's, it's like one of those, yeah. So of all the characters, he's the one with the great character arc. I'm like, are you kidding me? That's the guy with all the great stuff that happens in his life. So um, it's pretty, pretty, pretty wonderful. Like but, Riddler, he, he can come off as intelligent. And like, that's one of your skills as a voice actor. You can make hard, like, words that sound very, like, complicated come off the tongue. So do you think working, voicing Riddler in any way helped you with Ant-Man? Oh, well, it's weird because a lot of the characters that I get all have that kind of scientific. I don't get the big broody characters, the monosyllabic. Blah, blah, blah. I never get those yeah. guys. I always get the guys who can explain these scientific formulas <laughs> and the words kind of trip off the tongue. But it's probably from my radio experience because when you have to read the news, you're reading about, oh, there's my phone. Uh, you're reading all these different things about, um, especially in the Midwest, if you're on radio, you're reading all these agricultural reports, you're reading sports, you're reading all this different stuff. And you have to make it sound like you exactly know what you're talking about. And most of the times I, I don't. So I think Riddler is, is like a politician in that way, in where he can say all these flowery words, but I don't really think he has yeah. any any kind of concept of really what he's saying but he can make it sound good because he's he's so flowery and everything but but really the it, it's like it's like a can of soup the label is really nice and pretty but inside it's like kind of blah you know <laughs> so the but the riddler can dress it up and make it sound like he's smart because he does this flowery musicality with his voice but really he's uh, there's not a lot of substance there i think deep down inside he's just kind of faking it like yeah. a politician you know and like, yeah, that's the thing. Like, of course, I actually, one of my first interviews with uh, the vo a voice actor named Cal Dodd, who voiced Wolverine in X-Men, the animated series. And like he said, he immediately caught on to who Wolverine was and what he's about. He viewed Wolverine as someone who just wants to help out the little guy. So is that the same for you for Riddler? Like you just like, okay, I know who this guy is because obviously you knew who he was beforehand. So you, you could, were you just like, right, I know everything about this character. I know what he would say or like what he wouldn't say. Well, I, I came at it from the understanding of the vintage comics, but remember for the Arkham games, they had changed his character quite a bit because they needed the whole, what's the next generation of the Riddler? What, what would he be? He's not Frank Gorshin running around in the tights anymore. <laughs> this is a guy who is kind of evil and wicked and would cut a leg off a baby, apparently. Um, so we got to make him really different. So their angle on him was the whole game show host thing which played really nicely into the video game world because you had all these uh, traps and all these things that batman had to get through and riddler is always there on the on the monitor or on the speaker kind of yeah loading him into trying to figure out how to do this i mean at one point there was even like he was driving the batmobile into an elevator and the yeah. elevator was or something it was like wow that's a big elevator so uh it's pretty it's pretty cool but they had to, uh, for the next generation of the Riddler, they had to kind of reinvent him. And I, I had seen a couple of the Riddlers from the Batman animated series, but I wasn't 
really aware of where of what they had done with the character back then are you an animated series fan from the 90s absolutely yeah but i wasn't born when it came out but like i still managed to watch it i i'm like i watched the older cartoons i watched x-men the animated series and of course batman the animated series so my riddler was really you and john glover you you were like the only really riddler i ever knew because he wasn't in any films well he was in kind of when when like he wasn't in any of the nolan films so i didn't really know who he was right. until i knew about jim carrey and eventually and then more but yeah, you you were basically my Riddler, you and John. So, did did they have a lot of Riddler episodes in the um, tree the animated series? Just tree. tree. Okay. Wow. So, and the and the series went for how many seasons? I I can't actually remember off the top. I think it was a good five or seven, maybe. And only only three Riddler episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, chances are they might not at that point have known what to do with the character. They're like, well, who is this guy? Yeah, I think because he, he can he kind of. Man's is he a poor man's joker? Uh, you know, what is he? He's not really, you know, the penguin. He's not this. So uh, they may not have really known kind of what to do with him at that point. I, I'll have to talk to Paul about that someday. But maybe why didn't they do more Riddler episodes? But uh, yeah, I, think I think that that series is more about Harley and yeah. Joker's dynamic, you know, which is. I funny. think Riddler is such a cool character. But like, if you look at the original comics, he can kind of come off as, oh, I got you now, you caped clod. And then he's kind of you know, all happy and like, he's kind of corny-ish. And then for Batman, the animated series, they tried to do a, kind of a darker cartoon. So maybe that played a part into it, but I think they did a really good job. And John Glover was a very good Riddler from what we've seen because mm. this, like there is a potential for like, and your Riddler walked that line of kind of dark and then still being so upbeat. And then it just, it felt like it came out of a comic book, but it just worked so well on screen. So it was kind of a good mix of both. That was one of the things that Colette Sunderman brought to it, the voice director from the first game, was she was really good at directing me into those multiple levels of uh, go dark on this. Like start off with la da 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 da, and then just all of a sudden switch and go go really dark. And it was like, oh, okay, I, I get it now. Yeah, that's great. So she had a really good instinct about where to take those lines and, you know, into the darker areas versus the more. You know, the happier, I'm, I'm yeah. having fun torturing you kind of thing, you know. The, the old Dr. Loveless kind of thing, like I talked about Wild Wild West, where he's just so delighted about everything I'm going to do to you, Batman. I'm going to kill you. You know, that where it was just like a switch, you know. It's it it pretty fun. So I uh, love it. Uh, yeah, she, so she was uh, very instrumental in helping to kind of formulate um, that aspect of the character as well. Wow, and yeah. is there any voice like? Can you just switch on the Riddler voice, or does it hurt your throat or anything, or is that just easy? No, really. No, the, the John Arbuckle voice and the Riddler voice are kind of more closely matched to my natural. That's voice. brilliant. And then so you just it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Just do it whenever you want. Like you're at the coffee shop, I'll have a cappuccino or something. Man. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, it's, it's it's really fun in that. Um, where was I? Oh, I was in I was in my hometown of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, for a convention in 2019. And uh, it was in September, so the Halloween store, uh, Spirit, uh, had was open in town. So I went over to uh, to just kind of check it out because my nephew wanted to find a Jason Voorhees Friday the 13th yes. Halloween costume. So I said, well, let's go take a look. So I went over with my folks, my sister, my sister's husband, my brother-in-law, and, uh, and uh, Torin. And we were looking for this this Jason thing. So I find uh, they have a whole Riddler section. So they have the the hat, wow. the question mark jacket, the cane. Uh, it's not the it's not the Arkham cane, but they had these orange kind of shirts like you'd wear in the insane asylum, like orange, bright orange, and it said Arkham Asylum on the back. And I said, well, I gotta have that. <laughs> so uh, I take it up to the counter, and. Uh, one of the kids up there says, oh, I love this. I love this game. And I'm like, here we go. And I'm like, oh, yeah, what, what's your favorite uh, villain? Oh, I like, oh, I was like, oh, do you ever play the Riddler? It's like, oh, yeah, I played the Riddler. And then I did the voice for him. And they go, hey, that's a pretty good impression. And I'm like, no, that's really me. Now, remember, you're in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So people who do that stuff don't show up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. But they forgot there was a convention that weekend that the actors have flown in from everywhere. So I said, no, really, that's that's me in the game. Like, 
uh, how, how, how? <laughs> well, I used to live here. This is my family I'm visiting, but I'm doing a convention. I flew in from Los Angeles. It's like, oh, can we get a picture? <laughs> so I'm back behind the counter with all the, the, the staff of everything. It was, it was pretty cool. But I've turned that, uh, that um, uh, shirt into one of my bowling shirts that I like to wear at conventions because they're kind of loose and kind of my thing. So uh, I had wow. some, some alterations done on it. But I also had um, some embroidery done on the front that says Enigma, like N-Y-G-M-A. Like oh, Enigma. yes. And, Edward. Then the, and then the prisoner number underneath. And I'm like, what would be a good prisoner number? So I tweeted out, if the Riddler had a prisoner number in Arkham, what would his prisoner number be? And some guy came out with um, 8649 or something like that. And I said, why? Said, well, because his first appearance was in Batman issue 86 in 1949. And I'm like, that's brilliant. So that was the Riddler's uh, uh, prisoner number. So I just wow. wore his shirt around, and it's pretty cool. There, when I was in Florida for the Power Ranger uh, convention, there was a guy who did a great Riddler cosplay, and he had driven about like two hours to get to this convention just to like see me and take a picture with me. I'm like, dude, really? You went for two hours? He says, yeah. So he got, he got his signed stuff and he got his picture and his cosplay was amazing. And his friend was dressed as the scarecrow. And they're like, okay, well, see you later. We're driving back now. You drove, you're not, you're not here with the rest of the convention? I don't know. We don't care about Power Rangers. We just wanted to do the Riddler thing. I'm like, that blows my mind. So they wow. got back in the car and drove another two miles. And he's got the... Um, he was the Riddler from uh, the final game, which was Arkham Knight. Yes. So he had um, kind of the 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 cutoff. Oh, the uh, like short sleeve shirt yeah, and a the tank top. Tank top underneath. He was doing that with the kind of utility belt with the yes. things on it. Yeah. And he was all sc scarred up and bloody, like there's some stuff on. It. So he had done like the little band aids with the fake blood and everything. I'm like. That's wow. pretty realistic, dude. So can you imagine like getting out of the car, having a gas up or stopping for cookies and milk or, or, <laughs> or a soda or, or some Twinkies or something on the way home? And you walk into a gas station with all this blood on you and people are like, what the hell happened to you, son? It's like, oh, Rough no. journey. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was pretty exciting. But right. That kind of stuff. As, but because I come from the world of being a fan of this stuff, I can kind of I understand it why you would do that because you know I would travel well I traveled uh you know a couple what four or five hours to go see Sam Kinison in concert as a comedian back in the 80s I did and in a snowstorm so it was me and my boss and uh, another friend of mine and we drove to Minneapolis to see Sam Kinison and we drove back that night there was we said well so it's a five hours there, see the concert, five hours back. I don't know how we didn't crash and, and burn and, and end up in a snowbank, but oh, wow. we did it because we, we wanted to be there. It was important to us to be there. Yeah. So it was, it was pretty great, yeah. And another question I want to ask you is, if anyone was looking to get into voice acting, what advice would you have for them? Be a really good actor. Well, that'd be, that's very, that'd be an ideal part, wouldn't it? <laughs> that's, that's the most important part. Yeah. You have to be a really good actor. Um, and then once you hone your acting skills, um, yeah, grow your hair long. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, then once you hone your acting skills, then you have to get trained specifically in the world of, of voice acting because there's a lot of stuff that you have to know as a voice actor that you that on camera actors wouldn't ne necessarily need to know, like mic technique, about how if you take one of these Sennheiser 416s and you talk into it like this, it'll accentuate the higher um tones of your voice but if you cross talk it like this it'll cro it'll accentuate the lower tones of your voice so and and my technique like moving in being quiet or being loud or whatever so there's there's all this stuff you kind of got to know there's yeah. a whole protocol when you're directed of you know what the technology and the terminology means and what kind of stuff you know so there's there's a whole lot of stuff to know when you go in to this kind of thing but um once you hone your acting skills then get trained into voice acting specific protocols so you know what an abc is or you know how to take direction on some of the stuff and you know how the video game recording session works where it's just you doing effort noises for two hours and screaming your your lungs out for a couple of hours so it's a it's a lot it's a lot to know and that's why a lot of voiceover people if you've noticed 
don't go into on camera because they just don't care about it because that that's their bailiwick. That's their yeah. that's their thing is they just care about that. But now you get a lot of on camera people like celebrities and stuff getting into voiceover and they don't know the first thing about how to do any of this stuff. They don't because they're not voice actors. They're just hired from the standpoint of, well, what kind of marquee value do they bring to a to a thing? You know, in the case of Mark Hamill, he was uh, cast as Joker when he wasn't yeah. really doing much on camera work. And he so he was a celebrity and then not a celebrity. Now he's a celebrity. And but he was cast as Joker, I think, at a time when he wasn't a celebrity. He was just cast as that role as a Joker because he was the, a good actor and a, the right actor for the right role at the right time. He wasn't brought in because he was a celebrity. He was brought in because he was the right guy for that role. So, um, but now they're just casting celebrities willy nilly in these things just because they, they want a marquee value with very little regard to, well, are they the right voice for this character? Well, yeah. most of the times, not really. And they can, they just do what, you know, your average voiceover actor who's professionally trained can do in their sleep. And uh, a lot of the people that I know who, who direct this stuff say they don't like working with on camera actors because they don't know they don't know the, the the drill you know they don't know how how it works and they have to take time out of their session to like no 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 you got to stand in front of the mic you can't because when you're on a set you know and you're on camera the microphone's up here you know you got a boom yeah down, you have to, no 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 for this you have to be right here and you have to read all this stuff and the on-camera people sometimes they don't get that and they're not really that that good at this so yeah I, I'm, I'm really hoping that someday the the whole celebrity fascination the whole celebrity fad in voiceover kind of goes away there was a tweet the other day that said oh it was brilliantly written it said one of the most uh, egregious sins over the past 20 years is casting unqualified celebrities in voiceover roles that would otherwise be pretty great if it was performed by real voice actors yeah. so it's it's pretty and it was beautifully written I, I wish i'd have saved the tweet but i just retweeted it and i said wow that's they nailed it. So anyway, so that's the kind of thing. But um, yeah, what was your question again? I forgot. <laughs> uh, I can't even remember anymore. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I can't even remember. <laughs> it's a good yeah, direction no, no. to take it in. Oh, what advice would you have for voice actors? Oh, yeah, yeah. Be a really good actor. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's my TED talk. <laughs> right, um, exactly. But I mean, that that um, it's it's so funny because I say that when people email me, you have to be a really good actor. Well, I want to be in voiceover. I don't want to be an actor. It's called voice acting. There's acting and voice acting. You're just not on camera. You're still in front of a microphone in a booth, yeah. acting your heart out, doing all kinds of crazy stuff, saying stuff that you would never say in real life, taking words that somebody else has written and making it sound like it's coming off your, your own tongue. But uh, that always floors me when they say, no, I don't want to be an actor. I want to be in voiceover. Well, it is voice acting. That's kind of what you got to do. Even if you're doing a commercial for Bob's um, uh, Bob's seasoned meats, <laughs> okay, um, I'm not particularly into Bob's seasoned meats, but I have to sound like I am. Uh, yeah. I have, you know, I don't like seafood, but if I ever get a seafood job for a seafood company, I've got to make it sound like it's my favorite thing in the whole wide world. <laughs> and if you can get those jobs and make it sound like it is, I, I, I don't get s spectator sports at all. I, it's just not, yeah. it does not compute to me. But I get cast as sports announcers all the time because the way my voice is and everything, the way I can kind of do it, it makes, I can make it sound like I'm into sports and just whatever's happening on that field or on that court is just the most important thing to the history of man. And, uh, but I could really, in real life, not, not care less. But you're acting. You just need to make that character yeah. sound like it's very important. So anyway. Wow. And I actually, I don't think there could be a better way uh, to finish up. Wally, I know. Oh, it... I can. I can think of a better way. <laughs> oh, how? Go on, please. <laughs> oh, great one. Enlighten us. I have, because, because you're in uh... Dublin. Dub Dublin. 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 No, Dublin. Not, I'm not going to say like Dublin, like a, like a cheesy American. It's Dublin. Because you're in Dublin. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and green is kind of the uh, the modus operandi. Dang, A special right appearance from Kermit the Frog, of course. <laughs> no, it's not Kermit. It's not Robin the Frog, his nephew. Oh, of course. I'm green too, you know. 
Oh, my my I'm my sincerest like apologies. I'm, I'm, I'm green just like Uncle Kermit, but because we're talking to Ireland today, I thought that I'd come on because I'm green. Okay, thanks. So I imagine I'm taking the role of Robin as well as Riddler, both of them. Oh, yeah. What's that? I'm taking the role of Riddler and Robin, both of them. I'd imagine. A oh, Robin, Robin the Frog. Yeah, but I'm because you know the way I'm taking the role of Riddler from you. I'm becoming the new Riddler. Oh yes. Oh yeah, yeah. And Robin. Yeah, I'm taking and Robin. Robin the Frog. Yeah. Not Robin the Boy Wonder. No, 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 no. That's the other one. That's unrelated. I don't want him. Right. I want the frog. <laughs> but I, I could dress up like Robin the Boy Wonder. That'd be not, easy. not good as enough. Not as, good I, enough. as long as Uncle Kermit gets to be Batman, <laughs> then I'm happy. Yeah. Hello, testing. You too. Hello. I might as well. Is this, is this thing on? No. I'm green. I'm green just like Ireland. And I didn't even need to be rained on. <laughs> okay, take us back to Wally now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, well, well all right. I'm gonna sit here and wait until you go put that Riddler jacket on because I want to see that. All right. Well, we'll we'll, we'll do that after this one second. <laughs> we I have will to just, I will just sit here and wait <laughs> while you go get the Riddler. Is we it have in to your wait. Closet? I think so. Uh, I I'll go put. Uh, we'll wait until after this interview. Okay, come on. We have to finish this up. We need some professionalism before we're finished, Wally. Come on. Oh, heck no. I'm sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> All right, so Wally, is there anywhere people can check you out? Yeah. Um, are you a Doritos fan? Big fan. Yes. Are those off-brand? What's that? <laughs> are those off-brand? Those... This is the Doritos the way they looked when I was a kid. Oh, they wow. To, they used to be taco-flavored. Not None of that nacho cheese stuff. This is This is the original recipe of doritos when they first came out wow um, and i love these because they taste like they tasted when i was a kid um <laughs> yes wally on the web.com yes is my uh website um uh, at wally wingert is my twitter wally dot wingert is my instagram so there you have it and that's it and is there anything you'd like to promote or talk about hmm nda oh, yes I have a 13 story uh, uh, I call it a kids book for adults because I was seeing a lot of people at these conventions like Monster Palooza, I don't know if you ever heard of that, but a lot of these horror conventions of people who celebrate um, what's called dark Christmas. They like Christmas, but they kind of combine it with Halloween. So their Christmas trees are black and they put orange lights on it and the, instead of uh, little Christmas ornaments, they hang skulls and skeletons and zombies and stuff and it's pretty cool there's a lot there's a big movement toward and zombie elves and there's a big movement toward the uh, the dark christmas movement and it's kind of yeah. kind of cool so i wrote a 13 story series called donnie Druthers christoween capers it's about a little kid who's nine who creates christoween because he likes christmas and halloween both that's the same he's a little spiky haired weird kid that's not quite right he um he's a little kind of goth and dark but um, he's he's you know charming. So uh, Chris Deween, C H R I S T O W E E N dot net. And there will be a link it. for that in the description. I if I can, is there? It's on YouTube, is it? Uh, it's on YouTube under my well my my channel um, uh, is uh, Planet Wally Wood Inc. Uh, but you can also go to Chris dot net and you'll see samples of some of the stories and the stockings that you can uh, see that we've made up because uh, each of these stories come with like a, its own stalking not stocking not christmas stocking christmas yeah. stalking like a stocking um so you'll see it, but christaween.net will fully explain it and we're hoping to uh, find some strategic partner like a publisher or manufacturer or whatever yeah. who can bring these stories out someday so we're very excited about it um so yes that's the thing i'm kind of working on now because you know you can only work for other people for so long until you finally well i'd like to own something someday so i'd like to yeah. create my own thing so so make sure to check out that and I actually do think I have a photo of me in my Riddler costume on my phone. If I can wow. just find it now. Oh, because here we go. I emailed it to you a while ago. So just because I know Wally won't give me a break if I don't show it. <laughs> He'll be oh, emailing me. No. Hey, you're going to edit it in yeah? One second. Let me well, see. Let, let's see. All right. Let's bring it up. I think it's the one I actually, I think I emailed it to you when I first started. Um, you, but, but when you go to conventions, because you mentioned that you got a lot of the artwork there from, from conventions. Hmm? Uh, do you uh, cosplay at all? Yes, I do actually. I I did it a few times and I've been a few different characters. I was actually hoping to go as your uh, Riddler for one of them, but of course it was uh, cancelled to uh, cancelled. 
for a Dublin right. Comic Con. So, but they'll be back. They'll be back. Well, yeah, here's hoping exactly. Now, I'm just. What were the other uh, characters that you cosplayed as? Uh, I remember for one, I think I was Red Hood, and then a few characters from like different comic. I have the picture here. All right, everyone, embrace yourself because you're about to see the greatest <laughs> cosplay of your whole life. All right. And um, yeah, Wally. So here it is. If you can see it there, me and my Riddler jacket. Hey, you, you did send that to me. I, I, I did. I, you sent that a long time ago. I know. And what's this song? That, like, that was like over a year ago you sent that. That's um, great. Yeah, I know. Well, actually, it was, I think, I remember because I sent that to you one day before my primary school, elementary school for you graduation. So mm. that was like just before the summer. So just before you know, all of that. So anyway, yeah, there it is. Me as the Riddler. I, re I recognize that picture. I remember it now. Yep. You that, are all that, so that fits, blessed. That fits pretty cool. I mean, but that was several years ago, right? Now you've grown up. It was not several years ago. It was that like a couple months ago. Look, well, I, have you grown that much to where that yes. jacket doesn't fit like that anymore? I, I, yeah, pro I, I'll, I'll have to go try it on and I'll pull off a few buttons. My back will burst out. Um, but yeah, of course, there it is. You have all gotten to see it here. My very it's own... Riddler costume. Is your mom, is your mom uh, or your dad handy with a sewing machine? Sewing machines? No, I'm afraid not. We don't have any of them sewn. <laughs> oh, okay. Mm. In Ireland, we've yet to create them. I think it's more of an American thing. Like, just give it a couple more years and someone will come up with it. <laughs> right. Uh, I was going to say, if it's a really cool jacket, you could always put some spacers in it, you know, to kind of expand it a little bit if you need to. Yeah. It's kind of I should just come for you for advice. What am I talking about? You are literally a costume master. <laughs> well, you, you know, over here, you can just go down to the Halloween store and just buy whatever you want. It's a uh, yeah. hundred different varieties. So pretty exciting. And could you, as the Riddler, tell people to subscribe to the Daniel Fee 33 YouTube channel? The Daniel Fee what? 33. Turkey tree? Yeah. Could you? Tur 33. Tur turkey tree. Turkey tree. You're mocking it. It's my accent. The number tree tree. Oh, 33. Oh, yeah. it's a turkey tree. Like my accent. <laughs> oh, oh, hold on. 33. Okay. Yeah. yeah, my accent isn't that thick. <laughs> D D Daniel Fee 33. Yeah. YouTube channel. Yes. As the Riddler. Right. Okay. That's it. Do you need a minute to get into character or do no, you just no, 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 no. <laughs> Yeah. Like, look, let me, let me go to my trailer to get into. No. Uh, method acting has very little uh, room in. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is the Riddler speaking. I know you know who I am. I have no idea who you are because you don't matter. <laughs> Actually, I would like a favor if you would. Please subscribe to the Daniel Fee 33 YouTube channel. If you don't, I'll come for you. I know where you live. <laughs> That is just so amazing. Now, I officially have a subscriber video from the Riddler himself, so I'm going to hold that forever. That's going to be my new intro. Um, well, there but... you go. Good luck in your career and all your aspirations and uh, what you want to do. And uh, Yeah, all right. Know, so, the... yeah, let me just wrap up here. Okay, guys, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to check out Wally's work. His links for his websites will be in the description. Uh, as always, uh, please make sure to like and subscribe. Donate to the National Deaf Children Society. Link for that will be in the description. And um, but thank you guys so much for watching. And Wally again, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, but yeah, everyone stay safe. And yeah, I hope you all stay safe. Yes, yeah, so I'll see you later. Bye.